Um, let's go on. Okay. Well, uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, welcome to today's free public lecture that comes to you from the Society of Antiquaries in London. I say good afternoon because it is afternoon here, but I am aware that we are welcoming um, participants from uh, across the world. And indeed today's speaker uh, is speaking to us from Australia. I will introduce her in a moment, but first of all, let me just say a few words of introduction uh, to the Society of Antiquaries uh, itself, in case you are um, unaware of our history. Um, we were founded in 1707 uh, in the best sort of place. We were founded in a pub at a meeting um, in the city of London, um, and we were set up with the purpose of investigating and debating material remains of the past found in Britain. That was our original remit. That was then uh, affirmed and enshrined, shall we say, in a royal charter granted by King George II in 1751, which charged us with the encouragement, advancement, and furtherance of the study and knowledge of the antiquities and history of this and other countries. Our first permanent home was in Somerset House, the uh, great palatial complex of buildings uh, erected in the late 18th century by the architect William Chambers. And that gave us uh, a base that enabled us to house uh, and expand our library and our museum collection. And it also gave us a place more dignified than a pub at which to hold uh, our meetings. Fast forward 100 years and we moved to our present site of Burlington House in one of the wings that flanks the uh, London's Royal Academy. We moved there in 1874 and we have been here ever since, um, furthering our work in conservation, research uh, and in publication. And today our work is assisted by our charitable status uh, and we're committed to sharing our collections and our work with the broad public, which we do through lectures such as today's, through exhibitions, through seminars, <clears throat> and through an ongoing program of publications. And just last year, we launched uh, an exciting new development, which is called the Affiliate Membership Scheme. Uh, and that means that our membership is expanded beyond our core base of fellows um, to really anyone who is sufficiently interested in uh, our work, interested in the past, in archaeology, in material culture from previous ages, um, you, you now have the opportunity to um, join the affiliate membership and you can find details of that on our website. Now, I have to say a couple of boring things before introducing our speaker by way of housekeeping. There will, uh, at the end of the talk, be a Q&A session um, and we'll be taking questions from Zoom and from YouTube. So if any of you would like to ask a question online, please type it into the chat function on Zoom or YouTube, uh, and I will ask as many of those on your behalf as I can um, at the end of the lecture. So, on to the main business. Today's lecture is entitled Intertwined Histories. It is one of a, of, of a series of uh, lectures with that umbrella um, title, Intertwined Histories, Social Justice, 
the material culture drivers of indigenous inequality. Uh, and our speaker today is Professor Claire Smith, who is a fellow of the Society of Antiquaries uh, and is an ethno-archaeologist uh, based at Flinders University in Adelaide uh, in Southern Australia. Uh, Claire describes her work as decoding patterns in human behaviors to interpret the past, understand the present, and envisage the future. The material she analyzes ranges from rock art, statues and monuments, to memorials, graves, and nothing if not wide ranging, social media. She's worked with the uh, Aboriginal community of Barunga in Northern Territory in Australia for many years, uh, and with the Nagari people of South Australia since 1978. Uh, I hope you enjoy the talk, and uh, Claire, uh, over to you. Thank you. Lovely, thank you. Uh, it's a great uh, pleasure to be here to talk to people ab about this topic, and um, I'm very um, happy to have been invited. So thank you very much for the invitation and thank you to the folks who are turning up or who will watch this on um, YouTube or online. So the talk I'm giving comes partly from a paper that was co-authored by Jordan Ralph, Kelly Pollard and Sheree DeLuan. So I'm acknowledging them on, the, on this opening page. And the children here are from Barunga, the Barunga community where I have worked since 1990 every year, um, continuously, sometimes for six months at a time, sometimes 12 months at a time, very deep relationships there. Um, and these three girls, um, Alana, Chiquita and Shikaela, um, I've chosen them because really what I'm talking about here is the future of children. So I begin and end with children in this particular talk. Um, I'm recognizing that most people won't be, um, won't have a lot of knowledge of what's happening in Australia. So uh, this is the Aboriginal flag designed by Harold Thomas at the bottom, the Torres Strait Islander flag at the top, and the um, the statement, this is from Wurrumbun, one of the small communities that I work with, two young girls from there, uh, Crystal and Torianne, saying always was, always will be Aboriginal land, always was, always will be Wurrumbun, Buranga, Manyala, look. So Aboriginal people do not have a treaty and they have never ceded their lands. And these lands are occupied mostly, um, of course, by um, the descendants of British settlers and other people who've come here. The point of this slide is to give you an understanding of the diversity of Aboriginal Australia. So each of these, this is a map of Aboriginal Australia designed by David Horton for the Aboriginal Institute of Torres Strait Islander Studies, the Australian Institute of Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander Studies. And you can see the diversity of these language groups here. You can see up in really rich, resource rich countries, uh, very, very, um, a lot of diversity and in desert countries, people taking up more, more land. But if, if you think of that in terms of Europe, these are different language groups. So this is like France, Spain, Belgium, Denmark, um, Romania, Ukraine, you know, all the different language groups and different peoples, culturally different, linguistically different. Uh, if you remember nothing else from this talk, um, I would like you to remember that Aboriginality is about culture, not colour. So all, the person on the left, the, the woman there, is um, the mayor of the township of Clare, and she's a white woman like myself. I'm a European descendant, a British descendant. But the other people here are Aboriginal. So Vince Copley Sr. is Aboriginal. Nadri, um, um, Daryl Rigney is Aboriginal. Uh, Nathan Jerry and Jarwin girls, Kayla and Jasmine Willicker there. So Aboriginality is about culture. It's about being brought up as Aboriginal, learning about Aboriginal culture. And that can be confusing for people sometimes because they, they might say or someone who's just so light-skinned, how can they be Aboriginal? They're, Ab they're Aboriginal in the same way that you know who you are. You're brought up with a culture. I know I'm Australian, but I don't, I mean, I have a passport and so on, but 
you know, it's part of just you're brought up, that's your identity. And so that's one thing I'd like to just um, mention. Terms for our times, you know, using terms is it, it, we're talking about colonialism. We're talking about something that's inherently political. And so this is um, so it's important to use the terms or to be aware of the impact of the terms you use. Okay, so this presentation comes largely from an article that was published in um, the Cambridge Handbook of Material Culture Studies in last year, um, edited by Luanne de Cunzo and Catherine Rober. Um, and it also comes from some other previous work I've done. This is um, an article on pursuing social justice to collaborative archaeologists. And you can see all the people there who are um, working on the same kind of ideas, the same vision, really, Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people. And that article was published in 2019 in the journal Archaeologies, which is the journal of the World Archaeological Congress. And the other big um, trend in Indigenous archaeology, so if anybody here is following Indigenous archaeology, if I was to recommend one book for you, it would be Archaeologies of the Heart. And that's um, edited by Keisha Supernant, uh, Jane Baxter, Natasha Lyons, Sonia Adelaide, a mixture of um, Indigenous and non-Indigenous editors, um, but really talking about archaeology that is understand more and fitting in with that idea of emotional archaeology as well, you know, the archaeology of emotions. So that's a, um, uh, a, a really useful book. Okay, so the paper that we wrote and the, the, the talk today is really thinking about what role mater does material culture play in the unequal distribution of wealth, of opportunities and of privileges within a society? And how can material culture be used to create or to promote a more equal distribution of wealth, opportunities and privileges? And how can the study of social justice be used to promote social, um, a study of material culture be used to promote social justice? And it's nice and appropriate that the Society of Antiquaries um, was founded on the idea of the study of material culture. So I, I, I like that connection through not just decades, through hundreds of years. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the theory of this, and for some people it might be, you know, you think, oh, I might, but there'll be a case case studies after that will be more, it'll be come out. But I also think it's important to understand, to have the thinking tools for understanding what I'm going to talk about. So in 1832, um, De Tocqueville argued that injustice is perpetrated by differences in material living standards that inhibit empathy between different social strata. And he's thinking of the French Revolution at that time, and he's arguing that material inequalities explained why slave owners in America didn't empathise with the sufferings endured by slaves. So the material inequalities made people are used to create an us and them kind of mentality. And, to, and it prevents empathy, empathy being the thing that might people, might push people, encourage people to try and seek less inequality. Okay. And we're writing about, we're thinking about social justice and this is, um, so this is um, a definition of social justice from John Rawls that people, lots of people um, use. And he's talking about it really as a distribution of fundamental rights duties determining the division of advantages. But he's talking about um, how major institutions define these things and 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 how that it comes from from those institutions. Leanne Bell has says it refers to reconstructing society in accordance with principles of equity. So where Rawls is thinking of the rich and the poor in, ter in terms of material goods so much, she's also thinking in terms of opportunities, power, social economic advantage advantages. She's more, she has a broader view of this. 
So these are the two approaches to social justice. First, following the work of Rawls to find social justice in terms of a fair and equitable distribution of resources. And the second approach is linked to human rights and foregrounds histories, experiences and values of different groups. In Australia, if you're thinking of the history of Aboriginal people, you're thinking of truth telling. And that's a big trend here is truth telling history, telling, telling the truth, recognising how, how history, historical events have, have affected um, colonised people, basically. We're going to talk about social inclusion, social exclusion, but social exclusion, uh, according to Oxford Living Dictionaries, is uh, exclusion from the prevailing social system and its rights and privileges, typically as a result of poverty or the fact of belonging to a minority social group. So he's saying exclusion from the prevailing social system, its rights and privileges. But of course, everyone is in their own society and we all feel included in our own society. So for Aboriginal people, I'm excluded from that. You're excluded from their, their society. But if you're thinking in terms of access to resources, and then, of course, well, there's different resources in each society, but, but this is the, the, the more usual way of thinking of it. Okay, and the World Health Organization also defines exclusion as a relational concept, thinking of it as dynamic, multidimensional, driven by unequal power relations interacting across four main dimensions, economic, political, social, and cultural, and at different levels, including individual, household, group, and so forth. And the World Health Organization is thinking of it in terms of a continuum of inclusion to exclusion that's characterised by unequal access to resources, capabilities and rights, sounds like rules, which leads to health inequalities. And I will talk about a little bit about health inequalities in this talk. Inequality is not the same thing as poverty. Okay, so inequality is about relative differences and poverty is about, um, is about absolute differences. So put simply, poverty is when people don't have very much and inequality is when some people have more than others. And there's a really interesting study recently that was uh, done on plane, aeroplane rage. And what they were finding was that if the design of the plane, if they have um, like business class, first class, and then economy class, if the design of the plane is such that people have to go through business class or first class to get to economy class, there's more rage in all those classes than if people who are going through economy class go through separately. And so now when you get on a plane, if you're travelling economy, you'll get to a different, end, uh, different entrance to people who are travelling business, and that's part of that response to that, um, that um, recognition. So we're talking here about the psychological effects of material inequities. And what I'm going to talk about now draws heavily on a couple of books by Wilkinson and Pickett. One is called The Spirit Level, which demonstrates that societies with high levels of equality have better outcomes for everyone in all, all areas, ranging from education, employment, health and life expectancy. So not just for people who are poor, but also for richer people as well. There's better outcomes all over for society, a more equal society. And a more recent book they did called The Inner Level, in which they argue that the gap between, as the gap between rich and poor increases, which we are finding in countries across the world, as the gap between rich and poor increases between rich countries and poor countries too, so does the tendency for people to define and value themselves and others in terms of superiority and inferior, inferiority. So they, in, their, this, um, in this book, they demonstrate a direct link between the pressure on social status, elevated la uh, levels of stress hormones that show that rates of anxiety and depression are closely related to inequality, which makes status critical to an individual's well-being. So that in in inequality causes, the bigger that gap, it causes more stress for everybody as people are more conscious of that um, of the gap of the differences. Okay, so now we're back to we're back here in Australia. 
Canberra is capital city, so that's there for people who want to go to a very boring place, very cold, very boring, full of politicians. Uh, and Barunga, very interesting place in the north, um, is, is where I have worked since 1990. This is a, an, uh, a close up of Horton's map, and you can see here the different language groups. Kat Barunga's down here in Jawan country, but a lot of the people are from Malpong country, from Bulman, have come down here as part of um, in the 1940s and 50s really attracted by mines and work and you know interesting interested in white people some of the people who I have worked with can remember uh the first time they saw white people they thought we were very ugly and um I don't know that they've changed their view on that actually uh but they also were like how could people have white skin? This is really you know, very strange. So contact was in the 40s, 50s in this area. Some contact before then, but certainly up in the north, up there, here, definitely. I'm working on Bagala clan lands of Jawan people, and this is to give you an idea of the country that I work in and how beautiful it is. And it really is. That's Beswick Falls, and here is a, just near a rock outside, above a rock outside, and just some of the trees here that are just lovely. My Barunga teachers, the people who taught me for the first, they both passed away now and I am using those images with permission from the community and from their families. Um, and they, Phyllis and Manaburu, um, were my major teachers and my husband is an anthropologist who works with me, his major teacher. Um, Phyllis is looking at a plain English booklet that I wrote for some work that we'd done there. And Manaburu is... We're looking at rock art site and we've got kids from the school looking at looking at that. Manabu would say to them, see here, we're here, look at all these white people, they die. If they were here, they die, but you're Aboriginal, you're tough, you can survive this, you can live in this country. It's a sophisticated social system. And what I'm wanting you to see here is people are very interconnected. You can see the computer there, you can see everyone's looking at something on the computer. Um, it's a Everyone's very aware. They're aware that I'm talking here uh, uh, to you guys. And so they're aware of the wider world, but we actually live in a remote area, an area the Branga community has around um, 250, 280 people. Manyaluk has about 80, 90, Wurrumbun maybe 40, Beswick maybe 650. Very complicated kinship system. And I'm really just wanting you to see the 16 subsections of that. Um, I'm Bungan. You have to marry across this as the moiety system, yellow and red. And I married Gamarung or Wamut. Um, and I won't go into this greatly, but I want you to understand that you're dealing with a culture that is very sophisticated. Barunga Statement, this was 1988 Barunga Festival, which we have each year, and this was a call for a treaty. So when people are calling for treaty in Australia, this is where it really was given to Rob Hawke, this statement at the Barunga Festival. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, economic inequalities now. Um, and this is from the 2016 census. We've had a census since then, but they haven't done the breakdown, the detailed information since then. And so I can't um, offer you that yet, but I can't do have This is what we have for 2016. And you can see the weekly income at Barunga is $243 a week Australian. I'm not sure what this in pounds, but it's very little. Like the unemployment benefit here is around $450, something like that. It's less than the dollar, a lot less than the dollar. How can it be, how can people, a whole community have less than that? It's because people don't have literacy, so they don't have the capacity to even apply for the money that they have a right to have. So it's a really, it's a, the, the inequality in education is just the, the thing that probably worries me most because I see education as the way of, as the way, the way of, of people being able to achieve what they want in life. Okay. Um, okay. So here it's saying there were 363 people at the, the time of that census, but I do know that it's a bit less now. Okay. 
Okay, and that's Beswick, which is the, one of the other communities I work with, weekly income, $229. Yeah. The, the basic language is Creole, not English. So we're talking about economic inequality here, and I'm going to come into the material parts of that soon. Um, so um, in Catherine, it's, you know, which is close by, unemployment rate of 3.9 as opposed to 27.7 at Barunga and in Australia, the unemployment rate as a whole for that census was 6.9%. Okay. This is about the Northern Territory intervention, which happened in 2007, but we're still leaving with the outcomes of that. And I'm wanting to talk about this in terms of segregated communities and in terms of um, perpetrating inequality, really, I think. So you can see there's two signs here. One is the sign, these are both at the entrance to Barunga. Welcome to Barunga, a lot of art in that sign. And this is a government sign that was put up at that time. It has been changed slightly since, but it's still there. It doesn't have no pornography on it more. It's now it says um, prescribed materials. Um, and people were so offended because you imagine if you're thinking of inequality and thinking of how material culture shapes how you think about people. So that, that material culture on the left is how Barunga people want you to think about them, as artistic, as welcoming. They've got a police station, we've got a clinic. You know, we've got a council. We're, we're good people. We have some facilities here and you're welcome. That one on the right, which is on the other side of the same road, immediately opposite the other side, is says... What does it say? If that was outside your house or outside your suburb, how would you feel if that was placed outside your suburb? It seems to say you can't control alcohol. There's lots of alcoholics here and there's lots of people who use porn here. And one of the things that one of the community women said to me is, we didn't even know that word. We didn't even know what that word means. And I've been at Barunga for really since 1990 and I work there very closely and I've never seen porn there. Sometimes when they talk about Dirty TV, they're talking about, like, the, you know, whatever. They're talking about SBS television, special broadcasting services, which sometimes has, you know, it's mainstream television, really. But it's, um, so, you know, it's a very innocent society. To have that 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 sign outside and to grow up with that, that, that as saying that this is the kind of people you are, people you come from, is terrible. Okay, I have a student, Jordan Ralph, who did his um, honours and PhD on material culture at Barunga, and he looked at the signs um, on all the shelters and all the, um, he looked at the graffiti on those signs to try and see if there was a resistance against the intervention. And what he found was that the graffiti, um, it serves intergroup messaging, so it's about little scratchy signs and, and initials and so on, that are between Aboriginal people waiting. Not many people have cars, Aboriginal people waiting for other Aboriginal people. And this is contrasting to the use of, not of graffiti by non-Aboriginal people, which is around, you know, um, much stronger social and political messages. So one of the questions for Jordan was why? And you can see here, this is the intra-community, and you can see these are all the initials. And these are actually a whole lot of family members, some of them, BD and so on. So it's somebody, and that also says you something about people being linked together, doesn't it? But that's on a on a, a little part of a road sign. It's not a big sign. And what Jordan felt is that the material, the it provides this graffiti, provides material insights into a fear of government. Because what we found was the government signs were, were pretty well untouched, and it was only the community signs that people wrote graffiti on. So while we were expecting graffiti as a, a form of resistance to government, it didn't happen. What, but what that absence of graffiti on the government signs tells you is that people were frightened. And then we talked to them about that and they'd say, yeah, we're frightened. We don't want to mess with that government sign. That government might do something to you. In fact, when I was complaining, when I, we did some talks about the intervention and at one point we did them right around Australia when it first happened. And one point... Um, 
Rachel Candina, who's um, a good friend of mine, was with me and giving a talk in Sydney. And she said, Claire, you should watch out. And we were about to cross the road. And I said, why? She said, the government. And I said, what do you mean? She said, somebody might push you. So she thought I was causing problems to the point that the government won't push me. Someone in the government might want to push me under a car. Okay, so part of the work we do in, in our study of material culture is looking at everyday racism. We do re research on that and we're trying to highlight the role of modern material culture in the lived experience of racism by Aboriginal people and prompting people to read the material world around them slightly differently. So this is an article we wrote in the conversation and the point there are these children, Adam, Marlene and uh, Ho Yin and uh, Tanya. And you can see the sign behind, which says play at your own risk and multi-sport and exercise and all these um, photographs of white children, lovely white children, but not representing, not including um, the Asian children that we have, the Aboriginal children that we have, so the, the non-white children. So we wrote this article and sometime later that sign did go down, so hopefully somebody did show it to them. Australia does have a racist um, history and you'll be aware of the white Australia policy, I imagine, and which was very conscious. That was, yeah, what we did. That was the, and the thing that's kind of a bit shocking for, I don't know, for me anyway, and for Aboriginal people is white Australia puzzle, get the coloured men out and the white men in. And there's other examples, even a recent uh, computer game that was based on the same idea. And again, racism as exclusion. You can see here all these and all these um, white people. I love the fact that you've got all the different services there. You know, wear a different kind of uniform. You're still our kind of member. And we're talking about this is Navy Health, actually. But again, if you're Aboriginal, if you're Asian, where you're not, you're not included. They're not talking to you. They're not trying to get you there. So when the intervention happened, the biggest concern that people had, and you can see here, was their concern about racial discrimination, whether it was happening to white people as well. That was their biggest, biggest, biggest concern. And you can see 90% and outstations, which are more remote, were around 80%, but everyone else really, really high percentages, even 80% is a high percent. And this is that... Um, the pornography sign, which is now prohibited material, changed. But you can see here we've got a liquor act sign. And what you find is that signs beget signs. So, um, and that liquor act sign, that's that's actually one that's done by the community in that they choose to not have alcohol there. They've been choosing that big to, to deal with alcohol problems. And, and um and then you've got somebody adding this means niggers too at the bottom. Okay, a material inequality basics card. So Aboriginal people are given a basics card, uh, to which means that their government money is is half of it is on a card, and you have to show that at the shop. And um, I I would have no objection to a basics card if everyone in Australia had one. But if it's only people who are on unemployment benefit, then it's discriminating against them. And if, for us, in this case, it's only people who are in, when it started, in postcodes that were primarily Aboriginal. And one, like 99% Aboriginal. Um, and you can see how it, touch, it touches people. So this is a young person saying, um, I was lining up and I feel a little bit ashamed when you use the card, everyone knows that you're on government money and that makes you feel weak. It's a shame job. So um, th those little material culture things matter because they affect your identity. Paramorta, this is um, our hut at Barunga and this is a Paramorta card, which have now been um, digitised, but this is a material evidence or example of it. So you have to pay for your power in advance using a, um, a card here. Now you go to the shop and you pay in advance. People are constantly running out of power. And this is what Jasmine is saying about this, Jasmine Willeker. And people here contact me constantly because they, they, they've run out of power. So you don't get a power bill, you pay in advance. And if you 
run out of power, don't have the money to tap it up, or aren't able to organise whatever. And I, I know that people will say, why don't you just organise yourself? But if you're on an income of 280 a week, really, it's, it's not easy. Um, and then all the power goes off. So you don't have um, electricity, you don't have um, air conditioning, the fridge, the fridge stuff in the freezer goes bad, the fridge doesn't work. If someone's on an oxygen machine, I just don't, I mean, there would be, they would have to have some ba other backup system for that. But as Jasmine's saying, it makes people feel weak. It makes people feel weak. Okay, another part of it was, you know, um, fines for drinking in public. This is a Northern Territory uh, news article, well known for cover stories that include dogs or crocodiles. Uh, and here it's it's, just, it's assuring white people that, yes, there is fines for drinking in public, but it won't worry you. And police at the peace station and people have to show their ID. But if you're in a community where you're not allowed to have, where you can't, can't drink alcohol, then and then how do you drink it? Where do you go? And, and, and you've got little income. You can't, and you can't really sit around the pub or your money would go very quickly. Okay, um, so people go to a, a roadside facility and these are the roadside facilities at the top are for tourists. And you can see they're lovely, beautiful. Nice toilets, uh, water tanks somewhere there, um, nice facilities. These are the roadside facilities down the bottom for Aboriginal people, what people call, what we call the drinking spot. Nothing. Next to a river, this one was next to Roper Creek, so people could drink, get water from Roper Creek. There wasn't even in a place where there was power, where there was um, phone, phone connectivity. And so we had several people die and two people die in one accident and there was no one hit by trucks, um, big road trains. And... Um, it's no way to even call for an ambulance because you don't even have connectivity there. And again, that has now closed, um, but only just. You want to go to the toilet in Catherine? Oh, it's a big deal. Not a simple thing ever, honestly. So everywhere the toilets are closed, everywhere. And there used to be a fee of a dollar per person. I am... Um, to, to go to the toilet and people come from remote communities. I don't always say, I, I, don't, I have a card, I rarely have cash. So finding that coin was, was a big deal. Okay, I'm going to talk a little bit about the field school that I do at Barunga. This is Beswick Falls and there's a couple of the Barunga kids there. Um, and my tent, my hat and my my tent's the green one, somebody else's tent in the front. And we go there every year, we do a field school there. And we're learning from Aboriginal people. That's the point of it, is learning about culture from Aboriginal people. The point of this here is that material culture of the coexists. So that is young Duane, who's um, in an initiation ceremony, and his father behind him. Who's so? It, so Dwayne at another time will just be wearing shorts and a t-shirt. The things that we're learning from there, Western Indigenous cultures are very different to each other, and I won't go into this in great detail, but I just want you to be aware of this. Western concepts of heritage are very site-based and located and bound, and a kind of dichotomies and segmenting of time and space. Indigenous concepts of heritage are a living landscape flexibility of oral traditions, curation of knowledge by particular people, and enormous variation in the way knowledge is organised across Australia. Okay. Oh, back to, that's um, Edith Falls, which is a little neck lizard that's, that's made its sat down in the landscape, an idea of a living landscape where the ancestral beings stop, and that little neck lizard still lives there. That's, that is the breast of an old lady. This is not secret information I'm giving you. Um, and and she stopped in that place. That's a travelling, dreaming, a Luma Luma figure. So it's a, a, a landscape that's alive, that's very alive, and you can see the conceptions of place, space, and not segmented European ideas of straight lines with a couple of rivers, 
and Aboriginal idea of maps of circles and interconnections. Concepts of time, very different. Ancestral past, the European arrow time. These are two different ways I've tried to draw um, Indigenous concepts of time to try and get a sense of how it's different to European time. Cultural burning differences, we learn about that. And you think of the bushfires that we have, shocking bushfires in Australia, and look at cultural burning down below, burning in a mosaic pattern, totally safe, totally safe because it's done culturally. And this is Kangaroo Island after those big fires of 2019, 2020. And uh, King Charles actually spoke to people there at that time. And some regeneration. Okay. Material culture, markers of inequality, unmarked graves. So um, in 2022 and 2023, now the vast majority of graves in the northern, in Aboriginal communities are not recorded. When someone dies, they're put in the ground, but there's no actual written record. And we've been doing that for Barunga. We've been, and we've been asked by some Aboriginal communities to start to record for them too. We wrote this article um, a couple of years ago when there was some thought that the legislation might change, but it didn't. Um, and that's just saying that the research was community-led, really. And that project is identifying people in unmarked graves, but that's a real difference. You know, if you go to think of how the graves are in England and how um, European graves are, you know, you, there's a lot of, um, you go there and you can even think about people you, you've never met, never known, look at their names and what they did or, or whatever it is, information's about them. And this is a mix of traditional and contemporary practices. So that bow shed, the dead person there is in, inside there. And we'd, someone would go in and sit with them, family members before they're buried. And that's that person. And these are all part of the community I'm part of, that's me, that's my husband, Gary Jackson, uh, Kayla, Tisha, uh, all the kids, Marlene. Um, and the different, the material culture around mourning is really what I'm thinking of here. And the whole community goes. So it's, it is a little bit like, I don't know, I'm not sure what it was like in the 50s or 60s in small towns in England, but I think here people used to stop, then the hearse would go past and people would stop and if they had a hat, they'd take it off. You can see um, these are tiny communities. Anyway, recording those graves involves um, field training and that's Brandon Isaac Pamkal, Jordan Ralph and Clinton Winters there, Porter's there. And Brandon is saying, you know, in that graveyard, it's important because we all have family members there. It's a really important project. I want to keep recording these so people can know where family members are buried. And there is a business opportunity for us there and we are recording graves for some other communities. So it may be one way of using culture to redress inequality. I'm going to talk briefly about cultural survival and the Closing the Gap program, which is the Australian government program to close the gap in life expectancy and health and and so forth. These are the main um, indicators. You know, some are on track, early education, year 12, employment not on track, child mortality not on track. Child mortality is a little bit better now, but even so. And this this is, I've, so this is a detail that, and again, from this last census, I can't get down to this level of detail in the recent information yet they haven't given us that but you can see life expectancy at birth for aboriginal people non-aboriginal people in across australia very different and in remote areas different again so in remote areas it's less again and why a whole lot of health issues you know diabetes um enormous levels of diabetes and again, this one's from self-reported diabetes in remote areas. And you can see in remote areas, this is men of dark green, women are light green. And you can see remote areas, everything's, everything's more. It happens more. So when you're breaking down Aboriginal health in remote areas of the most, um, the ones where, where, where there's 
people suffer the most, really. Rheumatic heart disease, you know, these figures are incredible, you know. One in 25, 25 times higher than, 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 um, than in the non-Indigenous population. Kidney disease, you know, enormously. The trouble with kidney disease is that 90% of kidney function is lost without symptoms, and I'm going to come back to that. And again, here, we're talking about end-stage kidney disease here by Indigenous status and age. And you can see um, for Indigenous people, it's just off the charts in comparison. These are health inequalities that are driven by material culture inequalities that, and the material culture inequalities make us kind of not address it. They make it okay in some way, I think. This is just a little bit about COVID because we've been doing research on COVID or have been over the last couple of years and written about that. And this was the campaign where we, this is about inclusion. So we, and Australia did very well. Aboriginal, with COVID, Aboriginal organisations took over and they did a lot of the planning for this and Aboriginal remote communities, even though there was great risk of, you know, terrible, terrible um, death rates there. Um, it was led by Aboriginal people and the outcomes were, 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 were extraordinary, really. We haven't had any COVID deaths in Brungwell, Beswick or Manyala Lip. And these are some of the posters that people did themselves. So this is in Creole. We've been having two pillar, um, we've been having two pillar, two kinds of needles because we think about all the old people in our family. What about you? Are you having that second needle? Um, come on, all you young people. Make, you've got to make them get that needle um, for, for yourself and so on. So, and working with Royal Flow and Doctor Service. This is Margaret Catherine, a lovely, absolutely lovely lady. And it's the last day I saw her. And she died from end stage kidney disease. And on, when I saw her, this, she died about six weeks after this. And, um, and I said to her husband after, I said, how, why did she die? Didn't she? Didn't they explain it to her? And they said yes, they did explain it. They gave her it said long. You take this um, dialysis and you'll live long life. Take don't take it, you'll live short life. And I said, why didn't she do it? He said she didn't believe. So we have different belief systems we're dealing with. A COVID nineteen research based on phone conversations because everyone was locked down, so they were. They're segregated communities that were seriously segregated. They couldn't get into town. Town couldn't get out. Food couldn't get out for a while. It was really um, worrying. But phone helped. So this is Guy Rankin saying, you on one side, us on the other. We need to know what's happening. We want to know the truth. Because they're watching television. They're watching Donald Trump say whatever it is Donald Trump was saying at that time. And they're like, yeah. So thinking of the material culture um, impacts of, uh, I'm thinking of here, and this is um, more broadly in Australia, the Black Lives Matter, thinking of Aboriginal Lives Matter. This is a, these are Australian variations of this. And, of course, this is um, segregated communities and also spaces, the temporary living spaces of homeless. So there's a whole lot of areas in it that you can take, follow up with these um, and Kelly Pollard has done a lot of good research on, um, she's a, a, a Wiradjuri woman who's a lecturer at Charles Darwin University and a real leader in Indigenous archaeology here in Australia. And she's done a lot of research uh, with Larrakia people on archaeology of homelessness. So going back to Wilson, Wilkinson and Pickett. They see material inequalities as building blocks that are fundamental to the construction of social inclusion or exclusion in the form of class and cultural differences. And this is what they say. We should perhaps regard the scale of material inequalities in a society as providing the skeleton or framework around which class and cultural differences are formed. Over time, crude differences in wealth, gradually become overlaid by differences in clothing, ascetic taste, education, sense of self, and all the other markers of class identity. And going back to um, that, what we were talking about originally, which is that sense of empathy, those differences in material culture impact upon our capacity to empathise with other people. 
And finally, what we are talking about is the future of children like this. Thank you very much. Thank you for being here. Thank you for listening. And I am very happy to take any questions that anyone may have. Well, thank you, Claire, very much indeed. That was uh, fascinating. And certainly for me, who has uh, never paid a proper visit to Australia, I think I spent 24 hours there once, um, it was a tremendous eye-opener. Um, I'm looking in the, the chat and I'm not seeing any questions uh, here. Um, but I, I just wonder if I could possibly ask one or two of my own, um, because um, I think they're, they're, they're probably related in a way, but um, one question is, um, do you see uh, a potential tension between, on the one hand, preserving and celebrating indigenous culture um, and on the other hand, um, giving people the opportunity to maximise their opportunities? Yeah, it's a good question. And people thought in the past you need, Aboriginal people needed to assimilate to, to maximise their opportunities. So a lot of those initiatives of the, of the last 100 years, they were well-intentioned. They weren't bad people designing, but they were bad policies, but they weren't bad people. I think the way, what I really feel and the work I'm doing is using Indigenous cultural heritage and Indigenous values to drive those opportunities. So the field school, um, what we're, what people are working on, what the community is working on now is a, a knowledge centre where people can come and learn about knowledge from them. So you can use heritage and culture to drive education, to drive equity, to drive employment and enterprise. Um, so you're right, that's a good question. There is an inherent tension, but I think you can turn, you can use that. It doesn't have to just be like that. Mm. Um, and the other question, it is related to it. Um, you said at a certain point in your lecture that um, you, you underline the, cru the crucial uh, role of education. Uh, and you said uh, in particular that uh, for example, uh, a significant number of Aboriginal peoples are are not literate. Um, so I, I think we'd all agree, and that that applies across the world. Um, it applies as, as much in, in this country, in the United States, um, that that uh, education is absolutely the key. Um, but my question is, what education? Because can you have an education that is not sort of orientated to one culture or not biased in some way. For, I mean, for example, and I, I wish you'd had time to say more about the very interesting concept of time and, and the difference between the Aboriginal concept of time uh, and, and our own. I mean, how can you um, educate in a way that is, shall we say, culturally neutral? Does that make sense? I don't think culturally neutral, but certainly culturally uh, responsive would be correct. I just need to clarify, there are many literate, well-educated Aboriginal people throughout Australia. Uh, and even at Barunga, you know, um, we have some people who are very well, who are well-educated. But there are a lot of people who are not fully literate, who do not, who have, you know, maybe a year nine or year 10 level of, or less when they leave school level of literacy and numeracy. And that means it's very hard for them to get jobs and people want to hide that and they're shamed by it. So they don't want anyone to, to know. And then that means you, you know, your whole, all those opportunities close up. I think culturally responsive, I think education, and there's a big thing happening here about Indigenous science in education and, um, and also local. People want to know, so you could use the graveyards at Barunga to talk about, um, you know, to talk about archaeology, to talk about numbers, to talk about a whole lots of, of different things, looking up databases. So making it culturally, um, it's like anything, engaging, engaging for students, for kids. And there are Aboriginal, the education department does try. There are Aboriginal 
uh, classes. We have some some of the people that um, you've seen there, Rachel, Jeannie, teach at the school, teach Darwin language. Um, yeah, so there are lots of efforts, but it's it's um, it's still when people go into the straight white society, into the mainstream, when they've grown up in a little secluded, like living in a little village where it's safe and everyone's, you know, and then you go into the town and people are racist and mean to you and and um, and you you just want to go back to your little town, but there's no jobs in that little town. So, you know, how do you, you know, so dealing with, dealing with, with that is a really important thing. Um. This may be an unfair question because I don't know uh, to what extent you're um, well versed in in um, indigenous North American cultures, um, American and Canadian uh, as well. But um, I think what what I'm interested to, to um, ask, even if it's unfair, is uh, can you uh, compare um, the um, policies and uh, approach to indigenous culture in Australia with that in North America? Yeah, of course you can. Yeah, because they're all colonial environments and particularly Canada, a lot of the initiatives in Canada are similar. So, and the, the countries that are really pushing indigenous human rights are Canada, the USA, Australia and New Zealand. So those four are the kind of leading um uh, countries that le are leading in in pushing for indigenous human rights, um, and they've they've got the shared experience of colonialism, and so um, there's a lot in common, and people do ally absolutely. Um, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm doing some work at the moment with um, some colleagues in who are from all of those countries. Mm. Yeah, good question, and, and correct. You're right. Okay, now we do have a couple of questions, I think. Um, yes, here are a couple of questions have come in. Um, uh, I'm just going to read this. This is from YouTube. In terms of material culture, is there a distinct difference between taking an interest in other cultures' things and cultural appropriation? Ah, oh, of course. Yeah, that's a great question and a really... Yeah. Yeah, it is. Yeah. And it's really topical and something that people are really looking at. If you want the place to look to really understand how that, that about cultural appropriation, look at George Nicholas did an uh, eye pinch project, intellectual property um, and indigenous cultural heritage. If you look at that at Simon Fraser University, there's a whole database of stuff there. Um, so taking an interest is is good and that's recognizing who you are and that you're not appropriating is when you kind of put on an American Indian headdress and you're not American Indian and then you act silly and kind of den denigrate those people mm. so it's appropriating it in a you know um or taking a design that's indigenous and using it to make money for yourself but not not doing a recognizing the intellectual property of the artist and the, all the people that are from that community. So that's a great question. Thank you very much. Are there any other questions that you can see? No, I think that's well. Well, um, Claire, um, the midnight hour cometh uh, in Adelaide, Australia. Um, so I I would um, like to thank you very, very warmly, um, Professor Smith, for your really interesting uh, lecture to us today. Um, we uh, never cease to wonder at the marvels of technology that you can give us uh, a, a lecture uh, in the middle of the night from uh, Australia, but uh, from um, all of us here in the UK and your the rest of your globally spread audience, very many thanks.